Um, my name is Seth Manukin. I teach uh, here in the graduate program in science writing, um, and I'm the director of the communications forum. Uh, and joining me today are uh, three stat editors and writers. Um, to my immediate left is Rick Burke, uh, the executive editor of STAT, um, uh, previously a longtime reporter and editor at The Times, mainly in Washington, exclusively in Washington? I was in Washington for like um, uh, 17 years and then 10 years in New York. Be before or after? Well, we can get into that later. Um, Washington, then New York. So. Okay. Uh, where I wrote, I guess that would make sense because you were also a national editor there and assistant ME. Um, and uh, you came, your most recent gig before STAT was as executive editor at Politico. Um, in the middle there is uh, the always charming Carl Zimmer, um, <laughs> who uh, is a contributing national correspondent for STAT. Um, he uh, also writes regularly for the New York Times. Uh, his, he has a weekly column there now called Matter. Um, uh, and he writes for National Geographic, various other outlets. Um, I always find this a little bit difficult to believe. And I feel like you're counting your tattoo book, which might not warrant counting in this. But he is technically the author of a dozen books. Um, <laughs> including uh, Parasite Rex, Evolution, Making Sense of Life, and a delightful book on uh, science tattoos, which I own. Um, and at the end there is Rebecca Robbins, uh, who is a reporter at SAC covering money in life sciences. Um, she previously worked at the Washington Post, uh, the Hartford Current, and the Santa Barbara Independent. Um, and uh, she was also managing editor of the Harvard Crimson. So what we're going to do is have a conversation uh, for roughly an hour and then open it up to all of you. Um, when we open it up, we don't have mic stands today, unfortunately. Uh, but this is being recorded. And we won't be able to hear your questions on the recording because um, it's right from the soundboard unless you ask them into the mic. Uh, so please grab one of those mics on the table when the time comes to ask your questions. Um, so uh, I wanted to start just by talking a little bit, in, in case anyone isn't aware, just exactly what STAT is. Um, so Rick, why don't you take that one? Sure. If, if I may, can you just raise your hand if you read STAT, if you've ever read STAT? Oh, that's good. And we'll convert the rest of you <laughs> in the next hour. Um, so what, what STAT is, we've been um, officially launched about three months, and it's a um, it's a publication, online publication, with a national, international audience focused on uh, health, medicine, and life sciences. And we aim to fill a void that, that we saw in coverage in terms of writing for an accessible, uh, writing authoritatively and credibly about these issues for a, a broader general audience. Um, and We've, um, we have about 50 people total, including the editorial and business uh, staff. This was started by John Henry, the owner of the Boston Globe and the owner of the Red Sox, among other entities, um, who saw a need for, who, who's very passionate about these issues and saw a need just in, just in Kendall Square, seeing all these stories are there and there's not enough coverage. And, he said, we can fill the void, but he wanted a, a new digital news organization that could be more nimble than the Boston Globe in covering this. So we're, we're not um, tied down by traditional ways of doing things or ways of coverage or ways of putting a story online. So the Globe, we're an independent company from the Boston Globe, but they're our sister publication. And they can run whatever stories they want of stats in the globe. And we're happy when they do, because it helps our, it, it gets our, our stories out there, and it helps with our readership. And they've been a great partner to have. We also run some of their stories on stat. So that's pretty much what we are. And we aim um, to, um, to be a daily readable um, guide to some of these issues. And frankly, we could have twice as many reporters as we have and not cover all the stories that are out there. 
there, this is, as you all know, this is such a booming, fascinating area. We also, um, we have reporters, we're based here, but we also have reporters in Washington, New York, and San Francisco. And Columbia at the moment. And Columbia, yes, following the Zika scare in Columbia. And so your background isn't in science or science journalism. Right. So how did that uh, relationship begin? How yeah, did... I'm maybe we're the last person who should be in this <laughs> job in some ways. I was... Um, so I if was... anyone out there needs a job and is thinking <laughs> right. of applying... Right. I was rushing from um, the office Tuesday for a day in, in dealing with all these issues and rushing over to the Kennedy School to moderate a, an election night party on the New Hampshire primary. And I thought, wait, I'm changing back to my mm -hmm. old world. And this was probably the first time in decades that I hadn't either been overseeing political coverage or writing the story or something. And, and, um, and because my whole history has not been in this uh, world, but but my interest has been, when I was at the Times, I had in various jobs oversight over lots of, you know, all the news coverage. And one of my, and I remember calling meetings of the science department and saying, we need more energetic <laughs> report. I remember like, that was, I mean, I knew enough to know what, what we needed and what stories would interest people. So I've always felt, um, a good story is a good story, whatever the topic. And I think I'd like to think that I bring to stats or the general reader's interest in going after stories that people want to know about. And um, what we've done is we've assembled some of the most best known and respected people in the country, people have, um, like Carl Zimmer, um, who write about these issues in a way that gave us instant credibility uh, to our audience. And we have, for those of you who haven't read, we have this um, morning newsletter, morning rounds, that you can sign up for free at statnews.com. I've heard of that. Yes, and yes, I think you have. And it comes in every, mo every weekday morning at 6 a.m. And um, to me, that's a window into what we try to do because it's a mix of the news that we think you should know. It's not by all mean, any means comprehensive, but a window into the news in this world every morning. And what's encouraging to me is um, our open rate, which is the number of people who open the email is 49%. Mm -hmm. And it's been consistently 49% from, la from launching more than three months ago. And that's unheard of in the industry. That's a three times the standard for a newsletter like that. Which, and that tells me that people have a hunger for a source of this, of, of this news. People want to read this stuff. And they're, so we, we're building, I think, a very um, dedicated and reliable audience. I, I joked, and I, I guess I probably should have said this yeah. at the outset, that I've heard of that because for about 30 seconds uh, at the launch, I was working on the Morning Rounds newsletter until Rick and I uh, both realized that it was insane for me to try and do that and everything else I'm trying to do. Seth so. just didn't want to get up at 5 in the morning. You're right. <laughs> that also that did worry <laughs> most me about definitely you. true. Yes, that was definitely true. Um, uh, so, Carl, um, when you signed on for STAT, you're at a point in, in your career where um, you're turning down assignments for want of time. Uh, I know you're working on a, another book. You have your column in The Times. Um, you and I have talked a lot about the future of science journalism and where, where it's going. What was it that made this appealing to you? Um, Besides part, the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of what made it uh, interesting is that um, I had never really been um, part of a, um, a publication uh, literally from the start. And not only that, that, that would be interesting enough, but to be part of a, uh, an effort from the start in 2015 is really interesting um, because you know, you're, you're not spending a lot of time saying, well, who's our printer going to be and what's our schedule going to be for, you know, production and so on for the, the sort of the print side and all that sort of traditional stuff. I mean, basically w what was happening was that Rick was building a site, uh, a website, and um, bringing in all sorts of uh, interesting people, not just 
uh, straight journalists, but also uh, people who do you know, multimedia, people who do video, people who do animation, and uh, you know, people who I, as a writer, could collaborate with. And um, so you know, I, it just was a really exciting opportunity. I mean, I still get to do that, you know, that kind of uh, you know, really dig into a subject and, and write about it in the way that I always have, but then I can be just talking with people to sort of figure out how can we make this uh, different? How can we make this really work? You know, how can we make this something somebody really wants to read on their phone, for example? Um, and uh, so, so it's just been totally fascinating to be a part of it. Um, and Rebecca, uh, it sounds from your bio like you're, you have a 15 or 20 year career in journalism, um, but I think that was all crammed into a year or so, is that right? <laughs> those, um, but when you'd been working for those newspapers, you were primarily working on the print side of things, is that correct? Or? I was writing both for uh, web and, and for print, but in each of those cases, these were print publications, where that was the main focus. And so coming then to STAT, what, what was it that struck you or did anything strike you as being sort of fundamentally different about how that newsroom operates versus how the Washington Post newsroom operates? Yeah, I think um, as many um, folks who've worked for both uh, web only and print publications probably have experienced is that not having to worry about filling space or uh, meeting sort of artificially imposed deadlines as a result of the print schedule is a real uh, is really liberating and and I think uh, working at Stat I've found that uh, we really can run things or schedule the timing for for reporting based on what makes the most journalistic sense rather than um, factoring in other considerations. And I think for, for me as, as a reporter whose focus is putting out the best story possible, um, it's been a really great experience. So one of the things I want to talk about is um, what, it, what things are going to look like, not for stat, but sort of for the industry and for science coverage in general moving forward. Um, and it seems like at the moment, Stat is doing a, a pretty broad range of types of stories, um, uh, you know, in-depth investigative pieces, in-depth features, um, uh, video-only pieces, newsletters. Uh, is that because you've identified those as areas that you think there's um, a need or there's a particular desire, or is it sort of throw everything against the wall and see what sticks and then modify down the line. It's really interesting because it's, 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 it's been interesting starting from the ground up because you don't really know what it's going to be until it happens. Like we hired all these people and we were all having meetings about stories and everything. And, but I had no idea really what the, the, how many stories we'd have a day or what the flow would be. or You just don't know. And I have been surprised by, frankly, the quantity of stories we've had and the, the range of stories. It's more than I would have guessed. And I think it's because what we're focused on is um, telling, is being sort of journalistically ambitious and telling stories that other people aren't. And our main focus is really <laughs> not to be boring or to do um, commodity journalism that other people are doing. And um, there's again, there's no magic formula. There's no one way of doing things. We have the luxury of experimentation. And we will see what stories do well and not do well. But we're still so, so new that we have the luxury. And thanks to a a uh, publisher who's willing, is committed to the subject matter and to the journalism and not just um, making money immediately off this, we have the luxury of really being focused on the journalism and not overthinking um, other factors. So, um, so we're trying to do a range of stories, everything from investigative stories uh, an investigative story project that took months on clinical trials to... Um, what, what, what was that story? Th that was a story um, 
by Charlie Pillar, our West Coast correspondent, on um, looking at um, there, there's um, there's a federal law that requires researchers to publish clinical trials on uh, the results of their clinical trials on clinicaltrials.com, I think it .gov. is, .gov. And most institutions uh, don't do that and break, and essentially breaking the law, everything from um, Stanford to Sloan Kettering, big institutions. Um, I don't know where MIT was on that list somewhere, but you know, and we I'm did. Sure we were I'm on sure. That. Yeah, and we did a, um, a data visualization, so you could look up your local institution and see um, how 90% of the time they didn't share the information that they were required to share. And there was a reason why this law was established. You know, you know, I think it was. It, it all started with with when Elliot Spitzer was AG in New York, and I think one of the some of the drug companies were trying to get away with. Um, pushing research that hadn't really been out there. I mean, it's all, the, 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 there's a transparency um, behind the reason for this law, and that story kind of um, um, uncovered that. Um, I guess what I'm saying is we do everything from um, deep investigative stories to a quick piece today about a congressman on a committee today vaping using like an e-cigarette at a hearing today where we jumped on that story. Wait, which to, congressman? That's um, awesome. Duncan Hunter, yeah. Duncan Hun Hunter, and we got <laughs> the video of it. I mean, what we want to be is... Uh, is vaping allowed in the ha is it, is, um, <laughs> it's, it's new for well, it <laughs> to, to, a, to a poll we did with, uh, we do a monthly poll with Harvard, a national poll. We had a poll today on gene editing and how people don't want designer babies. I mean, we sort of try to weigh in on issues that other people aren't weighing into. We Maybe it's because of my own political background, but we've sent people out on the campaign trail in, New, in Iowa, New Hampshire, looking for the intersection when these candidates talk about drug companies <coughs> or, or other issues related to, that, that we care about. We want to be in on those stories. We write about drug ads, drug companies. We write about, um, and again, as Carl said, sort of a range of types of stories, stories that are video first, that are driven by, by multimedia storytelling rather than text. We, we've tried to do explainers that um, using, we have animators, we have people. We've, we've really devoted a, a lot of our resources into making science accessible and interesting, and, and sometimes even injecting a little, and not being afraid to have a little fun and a little whimsy not to, much. to make stories, a just little a little bit, bit a little to bit. make stories um, just accessible and interesting. When, when I was at the, one thing at the New York Times, I always said this, um, and this isn't, for me, something new to stat. When I was at the New York Times, I said, you guys are, Taking yourselves too seriously, you say you're the New York Times at the God, Times. At the Times, <laughs> I guess. and I would say like lighten up and have a little fun, make your stuff accessible. And there's a danger in journalism when you when you when you don't do that. And uh, you all three of you know how to write accessibly and understand how important that is to make stories readable and interesting. So. Uh, Speaking of clinical trial stories, um, Rebecca, I, I wanted to ask you about, I think it's the first story that appeared under the STAT byline several That's months right. before the site actually launched. Um, it was a piece you did about a clinical trial. Can you describe that story? Sure. So this is a, a story um, that I think um, telling how I, I discovered the, the story in the first place might be most illuminating. Um, so during the summer, uh, when we were preparing to launch STAT, I spent a lot of my time, as did other reporters, um, meeting with people, going to events uh, right here in, in Kendall Square to try to understand where the stories were and, and to develop sources. And, and one of those events that I attended was um, a panel discussion um, among some executives and um, experts on social media use in clinical trials. Um, and so while I was at that, that panel discussion, uh, the, most of the, the discussion was pretty boring and straightforward of you know, regulatory considerations and, and sort of the um, 
common uh, wisdom on, on this issue. Uh, but during the, the Q&A session, uh, one executive raised her hand and posed a question to the panel of experts um, about what her company, a small biotech here in, in Kendall Square, should do about a situation that was driving them crazy and, and freaking them out. And, and that was um, a very strange thing that was happening with their, their stock price. Um, their stock price was zigzagging up and down um, in response, they thought, to uh, social media posts that were being posted <laughs> by uh, two participants in their clinical trial. And so that sort of short exchange at a, a panel discussion ended up being the seed for a, a story that I did. I, I went ahead and, and talked to the patients who were um, posting on Twitter and, and Facebook and YouTube, essentially in real time, updating the world on the progress of a, a company-sponsored clinical trial. It was for a, a device that they had implanted into their spines because they were both uh, paralyzed in accidents. Uh, and this device, they hoped, would give them the ability to, to recover and, and hopefully ultimately walk again. And so this story that I, I ultimately wrote, I thought was a fascinating intersection of, of uh, business, of the patient experience, um, and of sort of the, the crazy world that, that social media has, has created. Ultimately, the company's investors, this is a um, public company, were watching the social media posts and um, trading the stock accordingly. So it was a, a really fascinating reporting experience and one that I think um, hopefully the, the resulting story encompassed a lot of the things that Stat wants to be and do. And, and you have a background in financial journalism. Um, one of the things I found so fascinating about that was uh, it seemed to sort of um, undercut the idea of rational markets because if you had a clinical trial with two people, those results would never be interpreted as meaning anything. Um, and yet here you had two individuals uh, who not only were going to be influenced by their own hopes and desires um, and their subjective experiences, uh, um, but other things could be going on. Um, were you surprised when you saw that having the effect that it did on, on sort of on stock price, on something on the bottom line in that way, and pretty significant spikes and drops? There, there were some significant spikes and drops, and it, it certainly was unusual and, and interesting to me. And when I asked experts about it, they really saw this as um, such an unusual scenario because so rarely do you have a company whose stock price is so dependent on, say, a single clinical trial. Most big pharma companies have many trials going on and many products in the pipeline. And then still rarer is when you have a clinical trial like this one where it's open label so patients know that they're getting the uh, treatment and where these were the first two human patients to ever get this intervention. So it was sort of this perfect storm as, as one analyst described it uh, to me. Um, Carl, one of the things you've been doing a lot of is, is video stories. Uh, um, science happens, is that what it's called? Um, can you first just start out by describing what those are? Yeah, so, so these are, they come out r roughly every month, and um, they're around five or six minutes long. And basically, the, the, the concept is very simple. I just show up at a lab and pay a visit. And uh, obviously, I don't just show up unannounced. Right. Um, but you know, I, what, I, what I do do is I uh, look for places where really cool basic research is happening that uh, is potentially going to lead to um, you know, advances in medicine. Um, and they can be all sorts of, all sorts of different things. So, um, uh, you know, we went to, you know, the first one that we did was at Johns Hopkins where I went to visit a neurologist who is developing a treatment for stroke, which is basically having people play a very immersive video game with a, with a joystick that's very hard to control, and the hu you basically become a dolphin. So basically, he said, sit down, and you are going to be the dolphin. And, uh, and 
you know, that was this great way to sort of like take you in and, and you get to meet, you know, the neurologist who's dealing with the problems with stroke recovery and, and all the shortcomings um, and this new idea about how to retrain the brain and then computer scientists who are trying to do video games that are going to be able to be responsive enough for what he wants, artists who just go and hang out with dolphins for like weeks and just do sketches to, to really make it, uh, to make it work. Um, we went to a, a, a lab uh, here at the Wies where uh, people are basically engineering <coughs> bacteria that they want to put into people to basically kind of monitor or manipulate your microbiome. Uh, um, another thing we did, we went to a, a lab where basically they're trying to understand death. Like, why, why do we die when In we die? Minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. In, In five, five minutes. minutes, that's right, yeah. Um, you know, with cameos from Woody Allen and Monty <laughs> Python as well. Um, but, you know, what they do is they study like thousands and thousands of tiny little worms uh, measuring their lifespans under different conditions. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's a totally new experience, which is one of the things I like about working with STAT. Um, but it's a different way of basically telling a story. Um, you, uh, and fortunately, I'm working with a really talented producer named Matt Orr. Um, and, you know, together we find a way to get the scientists to talk about what they do and tell their own story and find sort of visual ways to, to uh, add to that. Um, and then also there are talented animators who can put in even uh, more, more elements in there. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's been, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And there's no accompanying, that this doesn't go along with the textual piece as well. Those are basically freestanding. Like I'll write a short piece of text to just kind of like introduce it, you know. So there's a, there's a section of stat where we've been putting the videos and if you click on one of the videos, you, read, you can read the text and then watch the video and then just kind of go from there. And so what's the reaction been to those pieces versus pieces that you've written, uh, that have been written stories? Um, it, it, you know, very, very positive. And, um, you know, uh, I, think, I, th I think the scientists really like it in the sense that, like, this is something where, like, somebody can just sit down in just five minutes, psh, they get a feel for what it is they're doing and why it would matter, you know. I think a lot of scientists are like in a lifelong struggle to explain to their parents <laughs> why what they're doing <laughs> is meaningful, you know? So these videos are, I think are, can, can help at least a few children speak to their parents. <laughs> or, but, but also like I've, uh, teachers have told me that, that they're actually like really helpful to just like, here, let's, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show students a video for five minutes and that's gonna jump us into like a broader subject, you know? We'll deal with the textbook stuff as well, but this is a way to sort of capture the spirit hmm. of this kind of inquiry. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to just capture the feel of these places. And so, Rick, in terms of traffic, um, what, what types of stories are getting the most traffic? Uh, are they stories that also run in the globe? Um, are they videos? Are they... Um, it really uh, depends uh, on the story. One, one thing that's surprised me is some of the um, stories that, that weren't like listicle type stories have done very well. One of... Um, Wait, it surprised you that non-listicles have done well. <laughs> non-listicles have done right. it, do, it doesn't have to be a listicle. A lot of faith and video. readership. <laughs> right, right, right. So um, the, um, um, our, our um, best trafficked um, piece of all time was this, the 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 CRISPR scientists the fung story that that um, Sharon Bagley did that was like something like three thousand words which about was, Eric Lander no 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 the previous the no, previous yeah, but the, yeah, yeah. The, right, but, right. The, but but here she's writing about CRISPR and a scientist and it's like three thousand words <laughs> and that went through the roof in terms of traffic. And, and where, could you tell where that was coming from? It, it, it was translated in Chinese and all these points, like worldwide interest. Um, but was, but, it, was, but, was but, it fueled by Twitter or by? Um, and it was, it, was, it was both social and just people uh, sharing the link and share. I mean, there wasn't any. There wasn't any. I thought there was one secret someone putting right. it up, but it was <laughs> just generally just um, really um, did, did very well. And um, another. Um, um, uh, uh, and so, so you just don't, but also the Eric Lander piece 
that she did also did very well because I think people like personalities and writing about people. And that people. was a piece about a, a controversy <laughs> About, about a, a piece Eric Lander had written about CRISPR that right. was somewhat controversial. Right, and, and um, um, another piece that did very well, another profile with Slava Epstein that, um, that uh, Carl wrote that did a scientist that was kind of someone that isn't, isn't a household name that did very well, again, because it's an interesting personality, and people want to read about science. And, but, um, but, so, but I've also found that some of the, again, some of our listicles have done well too, like the six, <laughs> six things that, um, the six cures that are the most horrible cures that you can imagine, <laughs> you know. And, but, but we try to do everything we do, we try to give it some kind of higher end, high value, added value uh, credibility to it. We had um, a story that I assigned that ran today, and it was a little embarrassing that I assigned it, but I thought we should do it. And it's why it's um, Trump has called, you know, Rubio kept calling him out for sweating, sweating, sweating publicly. And I said, <coughs> let's, let's, it's, 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 it's in the public discussion enough that we should explore. Is there some kind of ailment that Rubio has or people that sweat excessively and drink a lot of water? Is that something we should write? So we, we took it in a serious way but not too serious and not too playful. You gotta get the tone just right, and I think, and we kind of slaved over just getting the tone right, and I think we did, because you want it accessible, and again, not taking yourself too seriously, but also not, um, you don't want to um, make, make too much light of these issues either. Uh, another story that did very well was um, Rebecca's story a couple weeks ago on Theranos. Um, all these, News organizations have um, have written. And Theranos is just in case anyone does not know. Oh, oh, Theranos is the blood. What what would you? It's the it's the, it's the you, company that's claiming that with a tiny prick of blood, it can give a whole range of diagnostics that normally you would need several vials of. And they were like on the on the on the rise and being celebrated. Billions for, of dollars yeah. valued at billions of dollars. And, 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 and we'll tell, well, you tell them what you wrote and what. Sure, so to continue that, that background, um, Theranos was this Silicon Valley darling until um, this past fall when the Wall Street Journal started running a, a series of um, very critical stories, essentially um, questioning the premise behind um, their, their promise to revolutionize uh, blood testing and diagnostics. And along with these very critical Wall Street Journal pieces, uh, regulators started to um, sort of crack, uh, crack down on the company. Um, so this company has been um, very much um, under fire for the last few months. And so there's been a ton of reporting done. It, it certainly is, is something that most news organizations um, and, and all news organizations in this space are, are paying attention to. And so the, the piece that I did um, didn't, didn't try to sort of do the tried and true task of, of journalism of, of on the ground uh, reporting. And, and that's been being done and, and, and been done by uh, these other organizations in, in this case, and their contribution is, is very valuable. But my reporting here took a different tack, which was to try to give readers a guide for what to look out for in the next um, few weeks and, and months to, to figure out really whether this company, this once red hot Silicon Valley upstart um, was, was finished, whether they would, um, could survive. And so I tried to map out for readers what signs to look for, what bellwethers um, in the coming weeks will perhaps um, shine light on, on whether this company is finished or not. And, and that story, as Rick said, um, got a lot of attention um, because I think it, it laid out in, in clear and simple terms for readers who haven't been following sort of every milestone development in, in other reporting uh, what's going on with and this company. And that's a good example of what we're trying to do here. There's all this, there's story after story and the Wall Street Journal has done a great job with it in driving the story, but then 
what we we trying to do at Status, or how can we kind of zero in there and and with added value in a way that 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 would be helpful to readers and interesting and authoritative, and that's exactly what we did. And people want to read that. And one other thing I just want to mention that and when you ask about audience and traffic is we did a project on um, concussions and on this base on this football player at Syracuse who had multiple concussions and was kicked off the team and then he was courted by several other college teams lower tier lower tier but who didn't really <coughs> worry about that as much and that had not been written before and we did a and that got enormous attention and it was a, a case of his this this guy AJ's personal story and we, we followed him for like a month or two, um, and um, we did a video with it. Matt Orr did a great video with it. It was like a four minute video, and what was interesting is, and this is what's cool about experimenting in the digital age. We did the video, and it did very well, but then we did a truncated version of the video that was like 30 seconds. It was like a trailer. Highlights of the video that featured words on the screen so you could read it at your desktop in your office so you didn't need the sound. Mm -hmm. That truncated version got over a million hits. It was just like went crazy <clears throat> because, and sometimes you just have to think about how people are getting their information these days. This is something we, we wouldn't have thought of before, but once that happened, now we're, now my next thing was, let's, let's do a trailer version of Science Happens um, so we can experiment yeah. with, and we did. That's a good idea. Yeah. Carl, um, I know that you uh, um, talked to a lot of other science writers. We're both involved in a community of science writers. Um, I, I, I'm curious about what the reaction has been uh, generally to STAT um, and uh, how people are viewing it, if they're, if they're viewing it as something that uh, might portend um, a different future for science journalism. Uh, how they see it fitting into the ecosystem, because there has been a lot of anxiety within this field, uh, you know, over the last decade. I think, especially over the last probably five years. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And I, I mean, I, I mean, I started, you know, like 25 years ago. Um, I was, you know, started out uh, as an assistant copy editor at Discover Magazine. You know, back when you actually like, you know, pasted the, the pages on wax paper. Um, and uh, so things have changed so much. And I would say, like, maybe five years ago, I was really, like, in a just, just kind of in a glum mood about what was going to be happening with science writing, um, just because it just, you know, th things were drying up and just the models didn't seem to be working anymore. But um, I don't know. I'm feeling more optimistic now. And it's, it's things like stat. It's also places like, like BuzzFeed, for example, you know, I mean, originally I thought of BuzzFeed as a place that, you know, had kittens and listicles and whatever, but, you know, then they just decided they were going to just open up a news operation and it just, they did it just on a tremendous scale. And then they said, okay, now we need to have a science desk here. And they hired <clears throat> a friend of ours, uh, Virginia Hughes, um, and who just then proceeded to hire like six or seven people and they just started doing great stuff. Um, and, um, you know, there are other places like Vox and 538 and so on. Like, there's a lot of places that are, have a really, you know, active um, science reporting going on. Um, and so, you know, will the industry be able to support, you know, as many people who were employed in, say, I don't know, let's pick a year, like, you know, 1995? I, I don't, honestly, I don't know. But, um, but you know, I don't, I, you know, I don't. You know, I don't look at it apocalyptically. You know, I think. I think actually, there are. There's. You know, there are places as places just sort of start up, um, without being legacy. People, places are starting up fresh and figuring out how to run, run things and experimenting and so on. Um, there are a fair number of success stories now. So that, that's a good transition, um, uh, Rick. Um, I'm curious about what the business plan is for Stat. Uh, where the money is coming from besides John Henry. I know that he's made a significant investment in it, but I also know he's a very uh, true businessman um, and uh, would prefer to make money than lose it. 
so what is the, the, the business plan moving forward? Um, there's, um, we're fortunate in that John want, is, is a shrewd businessman, wants to make money, but also understands that um, there's, um, we're all trying to figure this out in journalism. And I think what, what John would like is for this to be an example of a sustainable news organization that can do it and that can make it. And um, I think we've had a lot of discussions about how this might work or not work. And I think um, we've come to the realization that uh, a couple things is one of our, uh, our, our financial uh, success may ride a lot on, I think this is true of all digital news organizations these days, on um, on native content that, that, that advertisers put in and say, you know, sponsored content and um, where it's clearly designated that this is uh, not editorial, but it's... Um, and so na it's, native content uh, produced by the advertiser? Produced or by produced, the advertiser. Not produced within stat? Not produced within stat. So it would be um, like, and, and we've already had on our site like <laughs> Johnson & Johnson has had some sponsored content, well, they'll say, you know, some little n newsy kind of looking nugget where we say in a different colored sponsored content, Johnson & Johnson, but it has a little more credibility to them than just some ad that appeared on the site. So I think that's sort of the new, the, that's the business model for us to sort of encourage more sponsored content. That's what we're going after and we're getting, we're starting to get sponsors um, that are very interested in that. Um, the other thing is we're looking at, um, uh, we have kind of a deep belief that people will pay for good journalism. I think you're seeing um, the, at the New York Times, people pay uh, to the regular users pay money for the journalism, the Boston Globe, same thing. So we're exp we're going to be experimenting with different ways. Like of Politico Pro or Politico Pro, maybe some so paid, a paid version of maybe, the site. Maybe a paid version. Of this. There's we we actually don't have a plan. We we're discussing just variations. You could look at the Wall Street Journal, where certain stories you have to pay to to get or not get. We could do a Politico Pro thing where there's like a you know, a Kendall Square newsletter, everything you want to know about Kendall Square, all the inside dope, but you have to pay money for it or not. So we're going to experiment with that. We're experimenting with, um, uh, but, but, but the, the priority right now is to build the audience and, uh, and develop fans out there. And is there a, a, a time frame for when the audience building is over and the <laughs> Why don't you making... ask John Henry? I, you I'm know, Seth that. wrote a book on John, so it's like, <laughs> you tell me, is he, how long is he going to give it? Um, he, well, I tell you, he, told, he told me two more weeks. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, you were at the, at the uh, event where he said, well, before we launched, he said the runway, which I keep repeating, and to him, um, I said the runway is... Um, yeah, he said the runway is long and wide. So, and I reminded him yesterday that, or I told him yesterday that I was, at, um, you know, he was telling me he was just he's he loves like newsrooms. He was just touring the new Washington Post newsroom, and he said they have Nespresso machines all over, but you have to bring your own pot. Like they won't pay for the pods, and they save one hundred fifty thousand a year by not <laughs> supplying pods. So I told and morale him, in the Washington Post newsroom is sky high. Right, right. <laughs> so I told him that I was at the Nespresso store in Boston over the weekend. And I saw this this thirty eight hundred dollar really cool Nespresso like machine. It looked like a jukebox, like this. Really, I said. I said, I really want that for stat, but I don't dare do that until we're really in the black. And he said, send me the link. I'm kind of, maybe they'll give me a deal. So I'm going to send him the link on this. But anyway, so, but the, that's the long answer to my question is we are, we're serious about great journalism and the belief that John has, that I have, and the hope that we can translate great, that people will pay for quality journalism. That's our, that's our bet. Um, and we are 
trying to make that happen. So um, I know that that was somewhat in jest, but uh, speaking about a $3,800 espresso machine, um, uh, I know the relationship with the globe uh, is um, not a completely smooth one. Uh, there's been, I think the Globe has essentially lost all of its science reporters and editors, um, and those positions have not yet been filled. Uh, um, is this something that is being imagined as replacing what they had done in terms of science coverage? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say it's not been smooth. I mean, I, I would say... Um, there's this, a grievance filed, right, with the union. Yeah, but that's... That's, yeah, that's a group. I guess, okay. As, as my, the spin I would give you is, as the, the, is that the, um, as a former media re reporter here, this, the spin I would give you is that we have been able, and this is true, and I'll also give you the, the negative part of it. The truth is um, there's no n um, startup news organization that I can think of that has ever had this independence that we have as our own company, yet we can draw on the platform of the globe and the infrastructure of the globe, from everything from HR to IT support to things that we never could do on our own. We never would have been able to start up this quickly without the infrastructure of a legacy news organization. And I don't think that's repeated anywhere because um, in terms of, a, I mean, you have like upshot at the New York Times and things like that, but that's not a separate self-sustaining or trying to be self-sustaining operation. Um, on the on the downside, um, it's it's uh, I think for people who are reporters at the Globe who are tied to ways of doing things that are part of a leg legacy institution, as, as Rebecca says, when you have print deadlines and things like deliver, home delivery issues that you have to worry about that we don't have to worry about, there's going to be a natural tension, no matter what, in, in the building. And there is a grievance that, that um, from the Guild about like what is um, STAT and why are they, are they replacing us? But, well, yeah, right. but the reality is we haven't replaced the, the health and science reporters. We, um, a couple of them took the or left or took the buyout. They have, I think, a half dozen right now that still write for the Globe and that we run their stories, namely. And some have been like Rob Weissman, who covers biotech, has been really helpful to us from the start. But I think that, I, I don't think there are any more dedicated science reporters. Oh, and in terms of actual science. Um, um, right, like pure science. Right. Yeah, That's, and there, and there have there been. Only, there was, there was more than one, and there were also science editors. Um, and today, I mean, you know, I, it, it, right. I couldn't help but notice one of the arguably biggest science stories of the year, uh, the gravitational waves, the, the discovery of gravitational waves. Um, the Globe ran an AP story today, which I think probably a year ago would not have been the case. Right. That would but be that's my guess. separate from stat. That's a. Yeah. It's separate stat, from stat because stat, we don't stat cover. Didn't, stat didn't cover a gravitational right, no, waves. Right. No, no, no. Right. It's separate from stat in that that's not part of stat's mandate. Right. But um, to the extent that the globe science section has been replaced by stat, I think that there's potentially a relationship there. You mean in terms of what we could offer? Well, I think part of the, the reason we exist and part of my coming to this was the editor of the globe saying, We'd love to have more content, and stat. It wasn't stat then, but like we we could use. So, so in many ways, we fill a lot of like the business section. Uh, we have a Monday two pages of stat content in the Globe. So, it it has benefited to them. Whether I don't know, it, it has been of benefit, and you could argue separately that stat or no stat there's been cutbacks at the globe. Right. And anyway. Yeah, yeah. All right. Why don't we open it up? Um, I have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure you all get a chance to ask questions as well. Uh, so again, make sure you come up to the mic. Um, and please do not be shy. Someone always has to be, yeah, Wade. Oh, and uh, just again, for the recording, if you could just identify yourself. Hi. Wade Rash from STS here at MIT. Um, hey, everybody. 
So I'm curious about what you're learning about. Rick, you said you're building your fan base right now. So who are you, what are you learning about who those people are? And I'm curious specifically about whether, uh, how you think about, the, you, you're drawing in different types of audiences, right? A lot of your stories are very inside baseball, like pharmaceutical politics, right? Um, and others are more about um, uh, disease treatments and seem to be speaking to the families of, uh, of kids who have specific conditions. And, and others are about politics, right, and uh, the campaign trail. And so you're going after many different types of readers, and I'm curious where you're seeing the response and whether you feel that you can build a modern publication around um, like a whole zoo of different types of readers, right? <laughs> so wait, you're are you going after prosumers? <laughs> See, I would argue that that's what sets us apart, that um, if you look at some other general interest um, publications that cover some of these areas, they're, they're a little, they're more narrowly focused, and we are embracing stories on the intersection of popular culture and science, politics and science, but we're not afraid to write about the science of it and the more, the, the more um, sort of technical or more narrow issues or about people's human life, life experiences. And we have this column called End Notes about the end of life. So it's a very human type of, um, of approach. I guess what I would say is, I mean, you raise a fair good point. And um, what we are finding so far from the early metrics is that people, um, first of all, our audience is about 25% international. It's um, and is, do you know what the is that what what are, what's the globe stat for that? I assume that that's it's I, much you know, lower. I don't than know. That. I assume it's much lower. Right. So we have international audience. It's, is that higher than you expected? I didn't really. Yeah, yeah. Think that's of, impressive. Yeah. It's, so it's um, and we have um, the the biggest state we have is Massachusetts. I think because we're based here and because of the globe connection, and then uh, California, and then New York. But it's pretty much scheduled. Uh, we have readers in every state except, I think, North Dakota. I think there's like zero or something. <laughs> but, um, um, and in terms of demographics, we're finding um, a more male than I expected, like a majority male. And I don't, I'm, I'm not sure why that is. Um, it's also younger than I expected. I don't have the numbers offhand, but it was um, um, yeah, like, most readers seem to be 30s or 40s or 20, you know, just, uh, um, there are very few retirees or like 5% or something of our- and Rebecca's I, age and all that age. <laughs> and and um, a lot of people who are in, um, a lot of students, which I get to be, think of medical students, business people, um, 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 Again, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but, um, but one thing that has surprised me in terms of what people want to read, like I thought, um, I did it, like I had us do a story on um, 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 Charlie Sheen's doctor. When Char Charlie Sheen um, said that he was HIV positive, I thought uh, it's stats, obligation, who else is gonna, sit down in Hollywood with Sheen's doctor and write a profile of him. And I thought that would get a lot of attention. That didn't, it did okay, but not great, because I think people are coming to us for more the science and the health. I think people aren't necessarily trained to come to us for necessarily um, the popular culture stuff. That said, is I don't know the answer of whether like, I, I think it's way too early for us to react to what people want. I think we have to trust our gut in just offering interesting stories and see where that takes us. And I'm sort of happy with the sort of buffet of interesting stories rather than, um, like we had a story that Ellie Dolgan did about, um, what was that micro sound like the thing today? Mitochondria. Uh, yeah. Mitochondria. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that 
to me was a very, like you have to, he has, the guy who wrote our newsletter is a PhD and like he's, you've got to know this stuff to write about it. And I thought this is really authoritative and really interesting, but I also thought, well, get an audience. That was one of our most popular stories today because I think people are going to us for serious stories, but also our story on um, Bernie Sanders or returning his donation from Martin Screlly before we even launched went viral. So we just don't, it's kind of too early to tell. We were trying to hit business stories, science stories, um, um, sort of consumer, not consumer, but patient stories. And we are, one thing we're trying to avoid is um, health policy per se, because I think too many, there's plenty of places to go for that, um, for, for like the latest Obamacare twist. Everyone loves a good mitochondria story. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm David Chandler. I'm now at the MIT News Office, but I spent 16 years at the Boston Globe Health and Science section. And so I'm really curious about this new model and how, how it differs from what we used to do in the health and science section and what, what this new framework allows you to do that's different. A lot of the pieces are the same. A lot of the elements are the same. You, you say you have, you know, two pages in the Monday paper. We had three pages in the Monday paper. Uh, all of us who worked on the section, you know, also wrote for the daily paper. We had stories coming out every day. All of, all of our stories also ran online on boston.com. All, all of the individual pieces seem very similar. So I'm really curious about this new model. I'm, I, I'm quite excited about it. I think this is fascinating and very promising, but I'm really curious about what it is that this new structure, this new framework enables, what it lets you do that's different than, than what happens under the more traditional framework of, you know, back when the, the Globe Health and Science section was thriving, there were dozens of similar sections in newspapers all around the country. They've all gone away except for the New York Times section pretty much now. But what do you, what do you get out of this new structure? What does well, it give you? What does it let you do? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And probably the best person to answer would be Gideon Gill, who's our managing editor for Enterprise, who you probably worked with at the Globe, who went from the, he's the one person who went from the Globe to STAT. Um, and um, so I, I wasn't at the Globe, I've only, been doing this for X amount of time, so I'm not the best uh, person to answer that. On the other hand, I can tell you um, what I do think it's, it's there's a liberating, um, um, you're liberated from the requirements of a print news organization. And I found this at Politico, when I went from the New York Times to Politico, I mean, at the Times, I was very involved in us moving toward the web and digital and, but it's nothing is like being, and I go to Politico and nothing's like it. Like you don't, th your world is not geared around um, delivery and print and writing headlines to fit a certain um, space and writing a story to fit a certain um, space. You can think of an idea, ask for the story and, and there it is on the site, you know, in a flash, in an hour, in two hours. You don't have to go through the bureaucracy. And what I would say is um, if there's a nimbleness that I think you have to have to be competitive in, um, and certainly in any new digital enterprise, but to be in journalism, you have to be fast and quick and able to turn things around in a creative way. And um, I could just say from a purely bureaucratic point of view, had, had the money that was taken for STAT gone to the Globe, let's, let's say if John Henry had said, let's rebuild the Globe's coverage and put all that money in, um, into STAT, there's no way that in 
X amount of months, we could have hired dozens and dozens of people. It's just, it's just impossible because that's not how the world works and the culture and the bureaucracy of any, any traditional news organization, no matter how well intended or no matter what the quality. We can move on things and we can push things out. We can design beats and ways of coverage that may seem like they've been done before, but, but we, we don't have to think about any old ways of doing things or ways that were done before. We can experiment and create. And probably the biggest uh, ch difference, and something Carl talked about, is multimedia. I mean, stat, I would say like maybe 20% of, 25% of our newsroom is geared to multimedia, data visualization, animation, storytelling that's not text driven. And that's totally different from the New York Times, Washington, well, maybe the Washington Post now, Boston Globe, any traditional news organization. And that's, the, that's probably the, the biggest difference. I mean, just to add to that, I mean, I, you know, I write every week for the New York Times. I've written for them, I guess, 10 years now. And I write for magazines and other places. And you know, different, uh, each place has a different um, kind of culture and style. And newspapers, you know, you, you write things for newspapers in, in a certain way. You know, and there, I, I go to the Times with certain ideas, and I write about them in sort of the Times style. So what, and if what I is don't, that, it what gets... What is that certain way? I mean, how, how would you describe the difference there? Not, you know, not, not that much of a personal voice. You know, just sort of like, the, you know, you can sort of like, you know, you can have a sense of humor. You can, you know, uh, you can be graceful with your language, but it's got to be kind of within like, okay, you're, you're writing for the Times. Like, that's how they do it. And that's fine, and I have no quarrel with it. It's a great place to write about, you know, other areas of science. Uh, but then at a place like STAT, um, you know, like, um, it's just different. There are things that I'm, the things that I've been proposing to STAT that I just, I would just would not have proposed to the Science Times or the Health section of the New York Times. So like, like what? Like, yeah. Okay, so like, um, just case in point. So like, okay, so I'm on, I'm kind of addicted to Twitter. So I'm on Twitter and K kind I, of, kind of, yeah. And so I, so something sort of flashes up about someone's talking about Craig Venter, you know, genome pioneer. He's got this big hotshot company out in California, and he's making all these claims about sequencing your genome, and it's going to be great for your health, blah, 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 and it's going to be this sort of $20,000 concierge health exam. And so I'm like, the, you know, so I'm just like, I think I'm skeptical, as are, you know, uh, lots of people for good reasons, many good reasons. And I know that, you know, Craig Venter is on Twitter. So, like, I just say, basically, like, tweeted, like, Okay, Craig Venter, like, how is this not going to be, you know, just a whole kind of banquet of false positives, you know? <laughs> just come on. And he emailed, he didn't email, I'm sorry, he, on Twitter, he just said, like, that's very naive of you, you know? And I was like, okay, well, so I, so I went to Jason, and I was like, okay, Craig Venter just called me naive. And Jason? Could, Jason Uckman, who's my ed editor at STAT, I'm like, Craig Venter just called me naive, you know? So do you mind if I write an article about what they're doing? And so, like, like that, I was writing an article. Um, you know, there was no like running it up a flagpole or whatever. Like, I was on it, and I was just working on it. And it was a very sort of like. And so, was that was that the germ of the article, or was that part of the article? Was the was your exchange with Craig? Inventor? I don't think I ended up mentioning it in there, but it was just sort of. I just it was like, hey, come on. And you know, like, there are certain places where you would have to like laboriously work up a proposal and it would have to go around to but a bunch for, of for people and get scored about whether they can do it or not. I'm like, let's just do this. And and it was a it felt more of a, like a magazine y piece. There are people being very sort of like, this is I mean, excuse my French, but essentially saying this is bullshit. You know, and Venture being like, hey, like, you know, they don't get it. You know, like it was a very just you know, very brightly colored story, and I could do it at Stat. I don't. I don't think I would try to write it for a straight newspaper. But the, and for for people who haven't worked at newspapers, so the, a, a difference there uh, between what would happen at a newspaper is you would need to see if there was room in the next day's paper. It would need to go to the page one meeting or to the section meeting, and 
a couple hours later, you might get a decision, and that may or may not be too yeah, late. Yeah, you're, to on, a, anyway. you're, you're right. on an aircraft carrier. Right, right, right. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, it, it still seems nebulous in that I'm, I'm not sure that I couldn't have proposed a story like that uh, for the print paper, but I, but but, I see your point that but, there's certainly a... Let, let me my experience. You, and yeah. let me give you an example that I can say, or a, a sense, very directly. Um, there are many stories we do for STAT that we offer to the Globe that they run three or four days later. And, and we love it when they do it. We pitch them to and, <laughs> and, um, But they have to, it has to go through a process. Like any traditional news or it has to go through, do we have the space? What's it competing against? What is the, um, can we put it in our um, content management system that wor works? We have to write the headline for it. There's a copy editing, there's a process. So routinely there are stories that we've had in STAT. And again, we have a certain benefit of being smaller and we can just put up what we want to put up when, but there is a certain fleet-footedness that you have in a purely digital news organization where you can get things out. And I'll give you one, one example. Like, we started this thing a week or two ago called that every day runs it's, uh, Zika in 30 seconds. And the whole idea is what you need to know about Zika. And it's a way of showing that we want to own this coverage. We do a lot of in-depth, deeper stories. We have this uh, guy that's been in Columbia writing stories. We have well, a video <coughs> a series starting to, tomorrow from Brazil. But we want to show that like, if you need a quick fix, here's where to go. And, um, and I, said, like, I said, let's just do this. And there's some people that said, like, should we do it or not do it? If I'd been at the New York Times, it was like taking like weeks to like figure it out and go up the flagpole. I said, let's. At first, I said, let's do it, Zika, in sixty seconds. And then I said, no, let's make it thirty <laughs> seconds. It's just like you know, you can just try things, and it happens immediate. And there's a sense of we're on it, and a sense of news urgency that's always important in the print world, but it's even more important in the digital world that we can do. I think. I mean, just. Just as, again to broaden it out, I mean, just to talk, you know, we're talking about like the future of uh, science journalism here, and and I, um, I, I don't see things as going from you know, like a you know, a certain set of publications they all disappear and they're replaced by things like staff. I, that's not going to happen, um, and you know there are unquestionably like big advantages to different kinds of formats. So like. You know, if you want to go really extreme, you know, you can go to something like National Geographic magazine. So there, like, you can propose a piece. If you like, go from the time that you, you know, I, I've gone through this, and other people have as well. If you were to like put a pin on when you know you and your editor first kind of started talking about a story, and when it finally came out, you could be talking three years. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding at all. At all, I'm not kidding at all. And when it comes like out, might be average. What? I mean, you could be go much longer. Three than that years. Oh my God. I'm not kidding. And what comes out is gorgeous because, like, they, they basically say, okay, now we're going to take a photographer and send them out for six months to just like take thousands of pictures, and and we're gonna we're gonna you know we will do the most beautiful story out there about this, and we're gonna we're gonna work really hard in the pros as well, and that's fantastic. Uh, and, and I, you know, that's going to still be around. That's going to stick around. But it's going to be, um, and, and there are things, you know, stat can't really do that. Some near uh, lips to Rupert's ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, we'll see what Rupert Murdoch thinks about all that. But, you know, but they will be sort of making room for things like stat. That's my prediction. So, Re Rebecca, um, speaking of pieces that might not have run uh, um, in the paper, but something that got picked up uh, by a lot of places, um, you had another Screlly story besides the Bernie one. Uh, what, can you describe that the, about with his with his feed? Sure. So um, the Bernie Sanders donation, um, or the Merton Screlly's donation to Bernie Sanders, which Bernie Sanders ultimately returned, um, was not a story I did. One of my colleagues did, but um, relatively early in the um, hubbub over Merton Screlly. Uh, I wrote a, a piece um, that 
as many story ideas are, are now inspired, was inspired just by being on Twitter and, and seeing him post occasionally, in fact, frequently actually, um, posting links to a live stream <laughs> that he, he was doing on uh, YouTube and, and other sites. And so I started watching um, out, of, out of curiosity. Does everyone know who Martin Shkreli is? The evil Marvel comic <laughs> villain? <laughs> Um, so I started watching his, his uh, live stream, and this was, this was in November, so it was sort of after he had um, gained notoriety, but uh, before he was arrested on, on charges of um, securities fraud. And so the um, piece that, that I did while he was sort of at the rising in the, in the public consciousness was, was on this um, sort of bizarre and, and fascinating live stream that he was doing of himself, um, sitting in his pajamas, playing guitar, playing chess, playing video games. And so now, you know, after, after he was arrested and um, <coughs> in, in recent weeks, a lot of folks have, have done stories on, on his live stream. Um, so I think one advantage that, that Stat had was, was to um, be pay, having uh, reporters paying attention to those sort of things early on. And you can certainly make arguments uh, one way or another about the, the value of a piece like that. You know, it it's, may not have advanced the serious public policy debate about, about drug pricing. But what I think we're um, encouraged to value and, and what editors at Stat value is the you know, human side of, of stories. And it's certainly fascinating and, and telling of our 2015 and now 2016 uh, world that um, the pharmaceutical executive who is at the center of this uh, hubbub over, over high drug prices is spending you know 10 hours a day online live streaming his his everyday moves and you know sitting in his <laughs> office at work and that kind of insight that live real-time window into his thinking and his in some cases, rambling, I think is, is fascinating. And, and we saw value, news value there as well. Um, other, yeah, Jenny. Hi, Jenny Rood. I'm a writer at the Broad Institute. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you spoke about earlier, which was you know, filling this need for this kind of coverage. And in addition to the, the wonderful variety of topics that you cover in the, the health and life sciences fields, um, one of the things I think is really fascinating about STAT is the variety of the columns. So, I mean, it, it, Carl's videos or um, Sharon Bakley's gut check or, you know, to have the retraction watch, um, Ivan Aransky and Adam Marcus writing uh, about, you know, problems with scientific publications and to have that all under one roof. So my question is, um, how early in the conception of STAT did you have ideas for things that you wanted to be regular columns, and then obviously you have things that pop up after, Zach, uh, after STAT has launched, like Zika, that you've decided, you know, this is something we're going to do every day, or concussions we're going to do a regular series on? Um, I, I, um, what... It kind of all just came together, I think one thing, perhaps uh, my biggest fear at the beginning was um, knowing how sensitive and complicated this kind of coverage can be. And especially speaking from someone who doesn't have this background, I was worried that um, we, would, uh, uh, we would not be credible. And, um, I mean, I wasn't like losing sleep over it, but I wanted to make sure we were credible. And so we hired editor, we hired a mix of editors, but editors who knew what they were talking about, who could identify like, is this a bogus study or is this not? Or what's the proper way to describe this story? And there's a tension again between making, like we're pushing out things to be, we, we wanna be uh, like ahead of the game on stories. and. We, there's no um, uh, um, there's no room to be um, to get beat by anyone on any story. So I'm eager to be ahead of the game and give added value content. 
whether it's on Shkreli's live streaming or whether something more serious about um, the developments with Zika. And um, so there's this tension between being fast and nimble and quick, but also being accurate and right. And part of that way we're, we're able so far, knock on wood, to be able to do that is to have authorities in their fields um, as um, an important part of our coverage, from Carl to Helen Branswell, who um, covers infectious disease, who came, who moved here from Canada to to be our uh, one of our senior writers, to Sharon Bagley, who came from Reuters, moved from New York to to join us. We've had, to my uh, delight, um, a lot of people who have taken a risk to join a brand new startup who've given up um, secure jobs or what seem to be secure jobs that the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, Reuters, Bloomberg, Politico. Um, so they've had a huge group and people that are, um, that are um, knowledgeable and respected from the get-go. Then you layer over that some of the most talented um, uh, j younger journalists of their generation, and I put Rebecca at the top of the list. And we have some of the best and brightest around the country. So that mix just brings a great energy and authority to our coverage. More, yep. Hi, uh, my name is Frankie Shembri, and I'm an undergraduate here at MIT studying science writing. Um, and as someone who kind of wants to break into the field, what do you think sort of sets apart um, a great reporter from a good reporter in science writing, especially in this century? I think, I can, I think, you know, a, a problem is a problem that science writing faces is um, more so than other kinds of uh, journalism is kind of a sort of a pack mentality and everybody going f sort of obediently like following the same press release, you know, and, and writing it up and basically all telling the same story. Um, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes you got to do it, you know, so today it was gravitational waves. I mean, everyone's got to write their gravitational wave story and that's fine. Um, but, you know, which, you know, like which of those hundred gravitational wave stories was the one to read? I honestly, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but I do know, like, I like to read Dennis Overby, so I'll read his because I know about him already because he's developed a voice and he's written about things that I haven't seen elsewhere. So I think, you know, I think what science writers really need to do to, to, to make names for themselves is to wean themselves from the press release, from the embargo system, from being told by press offices what to write about, and to find the stories themselves, and just, and, you know, and look for good stories. So, um, and you gotta be sort of asking yourself about that. I mean, you might be like, you know, Rebecca may be like looking for something, be looking around and being like, whoa, wait a minute, like this is weird and important and no one has seen this before and I'm going to write about it. Or you just, I don't know, like, I mean, uh, Rick mentioned this story I wrote about the scientist named Slava Epstein. He, his stuff's been written about before. Um, it's not like a, a scoop or anything like that. It's just that um, I just sort of, you know, I, he and I had spoken on the phone and he just sounded like a really interesting person. And so I wanted to meet him. So I hung out with him and I was like, this guy is just got such a strange story. Like he was a scientist in the Soviet Union who was just, you know, basically like he was Jewish and so they, he was a marine biologist and it's like, they're not gonna let me get on a boat because they think I'm gonna escape next, the first port we get to. But, you know, of course, he's saying this all in this wonderful Those Russian accent. Jews. <laughs> yeah, right. He's like, but, you know, like, why? It was, it was fine. I don't want to be, you know, on a boat with some drunk captain who's going to just destroy my experiments. I'll just sit on the beach and do my research there. Oh, uh, you know, like that. He's that kind of a guy. And then he comes to America and he works the night shift at a parking garage, you know. And then, like, goes on to, like, discover antibiotics and no one else has found it. And I'm like, that's a story. It's not, a, I'm not, like, writing off of a press release. It's like, I found a story. And so that, you know, I think that's the main way to sort of like 
kind of make people recognize who you are as a science writer. Because otherwise, if they look at it, your CV and they're like, yeah, OK, you, you got that press release too. OK, fine, whatever. Yeah, to build a little bit on what Carl said, there are um, many, many more good writers than there is space to print good writers virtually or uh, in the physical world. Um, that is not true of reporters. So uh, if you're trying to figure out what to focus on, focus on reporting. Um, uh, you know, thinking about the stories that, that we've been talking about here that have made a mark, they're all, they're not all, uh, but a lot of them are stories that no one else had seen um, or no one else had made the calls. Uh, you know, that is Theranos Cook. That's um, what an old boss of mine used to call like a scoop of analysis. Um, but it's coming at it and making the calls. Uh, um, but that's the one thing that I see more than anything else um, when people are sort of frustrated <coughs> about where they're going with their career or what their prospects are. Um, there is always uh, a need for good journalists. And if you have a story that no one else has, uh, there will always be someone who will pay you for it. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Jane Roberts. I'm the associate editor of Undark, which is a new science magazine um, starting at KSJ. Um, I was interested in learning more about the native advertising. I was interning at Forbes before, and that's a big part of their um, strategy. But wondering if you've actually, you know, how, how far you are along in the process of deciding who you would allow to advertise on your site, and if you think um, that will affect the way that your readers see you and your credibility. Um, I. I, I should, the person who really should address this is our revenue officer, um, but, but in general, um, um, for example, I, I don't think, we, we haven't gotten any kind of pushback from anyone about our advertising or our, our native advertising or our, in our morning rounds, we've started running various sponsored by J&J &J or whatever, and we've gotten, I think we got like, um, three emails from people complaining or something, but people are kind of used to that as long as it's clear, clearly marked. And in terms of sponsored content, we've begun to do that in um, on our site. And again, it's clearly labeled. And we and I'd have to um, defer to Angus about what we might not use or but but we're certainly um, there's certainly certain basic principles of if, if we, with any advertiser, if there's something that we think is false or wrong or misleading or whatever, there's certain advertising standards in what will run. But in terms of clearly marked um, um, sponsored ad, native ads, I don't, I, I think that's, you're going to see more and more of it, um, whether it's stat or other news organizations, you know, the New York Times is talking about the Washington Post. Just that's just the way of the world. <coughs> and let me just say, there's things that are happening now that if you had asked me ten years ago, are like, oh my God, native advertising, or an ad in the front like, page of the New York front Times. Front page. I remember, I remember, I was at the New York Times when we were debating. We cannot have ads the front page of the New York Times. I remember Arthur Salzberger, who's the publisher, saying, we will never have an ad. I remember him saying, we will never have an ad <laughs> on the front page of the New York Times. Boy, just the whole world, we've all seen it, has, um, has so changed. He also told me once that uh, he wasn't worried about the internet because people couldn't read the paper in the bathroom on their computers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, other, uh, other questions? All right. Okay. Yes, in the back. Yeah, you you need to. <laughs> so I'm Carrie O'Brien. I'm a public relations specialist at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, what's your process for finding original content, maybe besides Twitter? <laughs> it does sort of seem like that's the main reporting tool. It's the main thing I've been hearing yeah. since I got here. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I can answer that as, as a reporter always on the hunt for story ideas. Um, I 
definitely find my stories from a variety of, of places. Um, some of it is, is social media and what I'm seeing the conversation about, but I find stories from just reading other um, news pieces that other reporters have done, perhaps a uh, you know, line in, in a story will, will tip me off that there's something more there. Um, other times, just in a conversation with a source about a different topic or in um, you know, just a, a conversation to, to check in about what they're doing, um, they'll mention something that, that triggers an idea. Um, and in some cases, too, um, press people have pitched me um, ideas that um, I'll say oftentimes the specific pitch um, that tends to be a little more incremental I don't ultimately run with, but um, there, there, have been, there have been instances where an element of a pitch might, uh, from, from a press person um, might inspire us to take a different approach or a broader approach um, to something that gets pitched. So um, in sum, I would say um, looking in as many places as possible. And, and for, for both of you two, um, do, you, uh, um, do you ever make calls and just sort of call around and say, what do you got? Call to who? Your sources. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, uh, as much as I can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because, <clears throat> you know, you want to find out what's, what's going on and, and maybe there's something that's sitting there just hiding in plain view. Um, and um, some, you know, sometimes, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I deal a lot with public information officers, and, uh, but, you know, if, if they're like saying like, you know, but, but I, I sometimes I have to sort of explain to them like how our interaction can be useful to me, you know. So if they contact me at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday and say, hey, I've got a press release about a gigantic, complicated paper that's going to be coming out at 2 o'clock today. <laughs> I'll be like, you know, are, what, you, uh, OK, great. So I, there's going to be a huge amount of superficial coverage of this. And I don't have the time right now to write the kind of story I'd want. So that's not, you're not helping me. Um, and I'll just sort of be honest about it. Um, or like with these, with science it happens with the video series. Like I just, I would go to places and I'd talk to people and be like, OK, like I'm looking for people and, you know, that maybe I could visit. And, and here, here's what I need. You know, I need to go someplace where people are not afraid of the camera. Um, they actually want to talk. And maybe they have some, you know, maybe we can, like, do stuff, look at things. You know, it's not just sort of anonymous sort of beige boxes. And uh, so can you help me with that? And, you know, sometimes they'll, like, say, like, oh, well, here's the list of our top hot scientists. And I'll be like, well, that's, that's not what I asked you for. And so let's try that again. You know, um, so it, 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 that, that's a big part of it. It does take, it does take work. And, the, and, you know, a lot of what I do is just, like, talk, talk to sort of a network of scientists and be like, what's going on out there? Like, were you just at a meeting? Did you see something at that meeting that I should know about? That's how I do it. And I'll add on to that. Um, I think, as Carl alluded to earlier, the PAC mentality that you sometimes see in, in science journalism can create a situation where, if a researcher hasn't put out a paper in the past two years, no one's written about her for the past two years. And so I have that, that situation with um, uh, a researcher working on, on um, a topic I was very interested in, which is medication <coughs> adherence. Um, and he had been doing some, some very interesting work that was written about two years ago and, and previously but no one had written a thing since then. Um, so I got on the phone with him and, and he's been very busy and his technology has been adopted all over the place in um, a way that is actually making a meaningful impact in clinics and to patients. Uh, but because he hasn't put out a paper in that time period when in fact his uh, research is um, making news in a meaningful way, nobody's been writing about it. So I think that those are the kind of stories um, that are uh, independent of press releases or sort of the manufactured <coughs> news events that the release of a paper can represent um, that we're interested in and, and always trying to chase. Yeah, big, those big papers are, can be like, people can make such a fetish of them. There's such a fiction, you know, that that's what it's all about. You know, those are, that's just like sort of putting out sort of formal presentation of some results, but it's not, you know, that's not, the world doesn't revolve around the paper. 
So before we go, I just want to ask um, uh, each of you uh, one last question. So um, Rebecca, you, uh, you're two years out of school. Um, when you talk to your peers who are at other, who are at newspapers or websites or other, um, uh, who are working in other areas of journalism, um, is there anything that strikes you as being sort of fundamentally different about what you're doing in your experience than, than some of them, and if so, what? That's a good question. Um, most of my, <laughs> my friends who are uh, working in journalism are, are not working in science journalism. Um, and so uh, I think the reaction that I get from a lot of my uh, friends who are um, working in, in other fields of journalism is that sounds really hard and complicated. <laughs> Um, particularly because I, you know, I don't have a science background. Um, I was a history major in college, um, and so what I have said to them is is that um, I really approach this um, first foray that I am in in science journalism the way I would with with any other stories, which is uh, why does this matter and um, how can I explain it and bring to light the most interesting and important elements. Um, in, in a way that's accessible, and how do I how do I get to the important and good story? And I don't think that's different um, for for science journalism as opposed to um, other other fields. So I think what stat my experience at stat um, has um, given me that perhaps others uh, peers that I I know are at other publications might not have is I think to some degree access to um, a great multimedia team as as Rick has talked about. Um, and the capabilities that, that we have there. Um, but I think also the opportunity to, to really specialize and get to know this field well um, has, has been something valuable. Um, and uh, Carl, for a non-stat question, um, uh, I'm curious about where you are finding the most um, interesting long-form journalism outside of stat. Um, uh, what types of places, uh, what types of outlets? I know there's been a lot of a, a lot of places that have either started doing that recently or have <laughs> actually um, uh, started from scratch. So I'm curious about. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I forage pretty widely. Um, you know, it, what's nice is that with um, with science, uh, um, it, 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 there are places. Uh, like STAT that have a lot of specialization on it, but there are like a lot of general interest places as well that uh, have sort of recognized the importance of it. Um, there, it being science. Science and medicine and so on. You know, the, the New Yorker has been doing some really good stuff in the past few years. I mean... On rare diseases, especially. Well, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So you got, if you haven't read Seth, mm. Seth's piece in the New Yorker, go check it out. Um, and, and But the thing is, like, the fact is that I would say, like, Ten years ago, like the New Yorker had relatively little. I was like, maybe you know, John McPhee talking about earthquakes. I mean, that's about it. <laughs> or oranges. Yeah, or oranges, whatever. But you know, now it's like you know, they they had a you know, Michael Spector wrote a great big piece on CRISPR, which was I thought was really excellent. So the New Yorker has been doing a great job. Um, the New York Times Magazine has been um, really starting to pull its own weight. Um, and so these are general interest uh, places that are doing science, and I think that's great because, you know. And, and I think what's, it's, it, you know, you don't want science to sort of fall into just like a little niche somewhere that only people who sort of self-identify as, well, I like to read about science, read about it. Um, and so, you know, the fact that there are people at STAT who do not have a very sort of narrow sort of science or medicine reporting background, I think it's fantastic because we don't want a narrow audience. We want a broad one, you know, so. Um. And uh, Rick, uh, is it, has it been a year or a little less? Than yeah, I, I came here like late February of last year. So I think I ran into you not not that long not after that long. you were here, um, and we were talking about how you sort of didn't know what to expect. <laughs> I mean, it was you know bo both in terms of subject matter and also it seemed like something that um, uh, to some extent it was like you know stepping off a, a, a cliff, <coughs> and, and you were interested to find out what would happen. Maybe a cliff isn't the best <laughs> analogy because there's only one thing really that can happen when you step <laughs> off a cliff. Um, uh, but closing your eyes and 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 making a leap of faith. Um, so now a year out, I'm I'm curious as to what uh, 
uh, has surprised you? Um, what's been radically different than what you expected? Uh, what's been frustrating? What's been satisfying? Um, I, I guess what I would say is that um, it's like, you know, it was this whole new world of not knowing what to expect and I'm never having done a startup before. And um, um, what's, um, and, and not knowing how it's going to be or what form it will take or who will do it with you. It's just, it's been a whole mystery. Um, um, but I've, what I, what's been great about it is I've just learned so much, not only about the field, but about building an, an organization and building a company and what it takes and things you don't think about. Um, and I've, I guess what I would say, the, the, the most surprising and gratifying part of it is I didn't really, I, I said earlier I was a little, I was worried about our credibility, but I didn't realize the extent to which the, there really seems to be a hunger for what we're doing and a real like dedication of people saying, I swear to you, and I, this sounds like I'm just promoting us, which I am, but it's like every day, I swear to you, every day I get a tweet or email or for some, someone saying, thank, we're so grateful you're doing this, or I just heard you're doing this. It happens every single day. And I never really anticipated that, and it's been nice to see the interest. And I think because, um, again, someone like me from a political background, there's a million sites and publications and newsletters on like the campaign. Or, um, and it's nice to have, um, be able to cover an area that's so important that where there is an opening, where there is an opportunity, and it touches every, it touches everyone. Like I feel like on the one hand, I don't have the specialization, but on the other hand, these are stories that matter to, to all of us. And, and I think the trick is, um, as you said, is uh, to, to, to have deep, good reporting and be aggressive with reporting, but also, um, in a way, I mean, Carl has made a mark for years in, in making science accessible and, and pulling people in, and a lot of people can't do that. So it's been a lot of um, the fun, the, it's been fun for me learning this, building this, bringing people in, and what's really cool about a startup as opposed to anywhere else I've worked is I can pick everyone that I want to work with. And every single hire is someone that uh, we vetted through a process. Um, and I would say pound for pound, like person for me that carefully. <laughs> well, look what happened. I but know, and, exactly. But per, no, but person per person, these are um, um, the, it, it's the most talented collection of editors and reporters that I've worked with because you know, you say, oh, you're at the New York Times, but the New York Times, like, you inherit different people and people come different ways. But here you can start anew with the very best people that make a sort of dynamic team. And just, and just one thing that's, that's kind of fun is the mixing and matching. <coughs> Carl's editor purposely is, was, we hired from the Washington Post, who was deputy national security editor at the, New York, at the Post. No background in this, in this field whatsoever, and I, but a great reputation as an editor. And I love that because we don't need, Carl doesn't need an editor who knows more than science than he does. He needs just a great editor. And so I love seeing, seeing these combinations work. And the other thing that I would say that's been a surprise to me is that I thought the hard part would be launching the site the hard part, and it was like all consuming and busy for all of us, but it's, it gets harder as you go along. It's, it's, and it's fun and invigorating, but my job is harder, and I don't know how you all would see it, but we're now up and running, and now there's like the demands of a real news organization every day where challenges come up and things we need to do, and how do we build the audience, and how do we, um, like we're very, I'm very restless. We're all very restless because we want to 
establish ourselves even more. It's never enough. We want to get out there and be known and do good stuff. I want to be out. When I saw this New York Times Zika uh, big takeout over the, on Sunday, I thought, why? I didn't even think of doing that. And, and so, we, we're, so there's challenges every day to be journalistically competitive. So it's, it's harder, but it's, it's fun to have the challenge. And let me, if I may, take one minute, because part of the challenge I have is to be sort of a huckster for what we're, we're doing. And I would say most of you said you know, you, you see stat or read stat, but it takes, we're trying to build an audience organically, person by person. You can't just, you know, we had advertising on the New York Times website, didn't do a thing for our, for our that I saw for our traffic, because it's got to be person to person building the audience. And we're gaining an audience every day, it, you know, it creeps up. But I would ask <coughs> you to, if you haven't already, to sign up for Morning Rounds, which is free on the site, because um, it's really a great window into what we do every day, 6 a.m. every morning. And also, um, if, you, um, if you're on Twitter or Facebook, to like us or follow us, because really it's just building person per person, building an audience. And so far, I'm very grateful for, what, for, for the audience and for these international readers. But, um, but I won't be satisfied until it just gets bigger and more and, and bigger and bigger and where we can start um, supporting ourselves. Uh, one word answer. Um, uh, who uh, has uh, thinner skin, politicians or scientists? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I would. No, I, Carl's never Carl, done politicians. Are you um, kidding? I don't write I about politics. Say, I would say scientists because they're not used to the coverage. In the in that kind yeah, yeah. of way, I would agree. What, what would you yeah, say? I would agree. Yeah. Hmm. All right. There you go. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. Let's give a huge round of applause. Carl came down from Connecticut. Rebecca and Rick both have um, uh, a ton of work to do. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, and uh, the this will be posted online within the next couple of days.